Firstly, just wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you so much uh, for coming to this conference. Um, I know I speak on behalf of everybody here that um, I, I've really learned a lot um, and I'm just really, really grateful for everybody giving up their time and their wisdom and for sharing uh, their experiences um, and all their, not all their knowledge with us. Um, you know, uh, you also created a really positive atmosphere um, and really like comradely discussions. And I think that's really appreciated by everybody. Um, I also just want to thank uh, the staff at SAAS, uh, particularly the IT, catering, um, cleaning staff, administrative staff. You know, none of this happens uh, by itself. Uh, it depends on a lot of labor. Um, so yeah, just thank you to, to everybody who's been a part of this. And then Kate Grady isn't here, but thank you to Kate Grady and to Scott Newton as well um, for their invaluable uh, support. And to also to Caroline, um, who's been just unbelievable and amazing throughout this conference. So yeah, thanks to everybody. Um, I'm now... Now I'm really uh, excited to uh, chair this roundtable discussion. Uh, what does it mean to decolonize criminal justice? So throughout this conference, we've seen just how difficult it is to disentangle systems of carcerality and criminal justice from colonial histories, legacies and continuities. And, you know, perhaps most explicitly, we started this with our first panel, um, prisons across uh, prisons as colonial relics across Africa, um, to see how many prisons that are still in use today um, were literally built by colonial authorities. And throughout this conference, we've seen how this extends far beyond, of course, the African continent um, and indeed way beyond prisons, uh, also to policing and judiciaries and beyond physical infrastructure, obviously. And, you know, colonialities don't just appear in prison walls or on the police uniform, uh, but also in the hierarchies of race, class and gender that these systems uphold. And so this begs the question, if we are committed to decolonization, uh, which I hope we are, um, then what does this mean for the future uh, for our systems of criminal justice? And it might seem trivial, but I think it's important to ask this question, what does it mean, rather than how can we decolonize uh, systems of criminal justice? Because I think the former really opens up a possibility that the latter doesn't which is that we're not able to decolonize systems of criminal justice. Um, and it's precisely in understanding what it means to decolonize systems of criminal justice that might lead us to conclude whether this actually is a worthwhile endeavor or not. Um, because there is this kind of fundamental uh, tension uh, between transforming our systems based on decolonization or maybe dismantling them altogether. And what does decolonization um, actually require? So I'm really delighted to be joined by four um, amazing speakers. Um, the first is Anna Alaverti, who is a professor of law at the School of Law, University of Warwick. Um, her research explores questions of national identity and belonging in criminal justice and of law, sovereignty and globalization. She has led extensive empirical work in the UK's criminal justice and immigration systems. She's the author of Crimes uh, of Mobility, Policing the Borders Within, and she is also co-director co of the Criminal Justice Centre at Warwick and the Associate Director of Border Criminologies. She's also co-editor of the book Decolonising the Criminal Question, Rethinking the Colonial Legacies, Epistemologies and Geographies of Criminal Justice. Our second speaker is Dr Eddie Bruce-Jones, who is the Executive Dean of the School of Law at Birkbeck. He's a member of the New York Bar and Associate Academic Fellow of the Inner Temple, He's author of Race in the Shadow of Law, State Violence in Contemporary Europe, and he serves on the board of directors of the Institute of Race Relations and Rainbow Migration, as well as the advisory board of the Center for Intersectional Justice. He has advised various intergovernmental and civil society organizations on issues of racism and human rights, including the Office of the UN High Commission on Human Rights and the Equality Committee of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. He's an editor of the Journal of Immigration, Asylum and Nationality Law and advisor to the European Law Open. Dr. Lisa Long is a senior lecturer in criminology. She joined Leeds Beckett University in 2015 and has taught on a range of criminology modules. Her research interests include race and racisms, inequalities in the criminal justice system and critical race theory slash criminology. Lisa was awarded her doctorate in 2016 by the University of Leeds and her monograph, Perpetual Suspects, a Critical Race Theory of Black and Mixed Race Experiences of Policing, is recently published with Powergrave Macmillan. 
And finally, we have Vanessa E. Thompson joining us online, um, who is an assistant professor in Black Studies at the Department of Gender Studies, Queen's University. Her scholarship and teaching focuses on Black Studies and anti-colonialism, state violence and abolition, critical racism, migration and border studies, multiracial solidarities, internationalism from below and activist ethnographies. She's published on blackness and black movements in France and Europe more broadly, and black abolitionist struggles and world making. Vanessa is a member of the International Independent Commission on the Death of Uri Jallo and organizes with abolitionist feminist collectives in Europe and globally. That's a very big rap sheet for all of these uh, speakers. So thank you so much for, for being with us. And I thought I'd just ask each of you to offer some kind of opening brief remarks on what you broadly think of this question of decolonizing, uh, decolonizing criminal justice. Anna, did you want to start? Yeah, sure. Hello, everyone. Um, it's a bit difficult to follow up from the film. I still have my uh, yeah, emotional uh, state, um, but uh, I'll try. Uh, so what thinking about uh, the the question that Oli posed, and, and thank you very much, Oli, for, for the invitation and for uh, organizing this amazing conference. Um, so, so thinking around the, the question that Oli posed uh, around what um, do I understood to mean uh, this idea of the relationship between decolonization and um, criminal justice. And, and for me, decolonization is a um, deconstruction exercise that builds on a range of traditions. And, and, in, and this way, I, I, I'm a bit unease about kind of thinking about different kind of um, a strands of uh, criminology or, 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 or criminological theories around, you know, southern or decolonizing or abolitionist uh, theory. I think um, feminist theory, critical race theory, I think, uh, you know, decolonization builds a lot around the concepts, uh, the ideas, um, the rethinking about epistemology, ep epistemologies that um, are taking forward and, and are kind of re rethought uh, in the in you know post-colonial theories and cultural studies, uh, etc. So it, it is a deconstruction work that is uh, is both intellectual, uh, is political, and is ethical. Uh, and it engages with rethinks um, the the practices, the concepts, the spaces, the epistemologies that um, we uh, that shape the way we um, understand uh, our our field of uh, of research, and in particular, it um, foregrounds. Uh, historical, very complex and very diverse historical uh, processes that we, we might call colonialisms and imperialisms, because as we saw throughout the, the, the conference, the way in which uh, we dealt with and we conceptualize uh, colonialism and the context that we uh, study are very different and and with it you know there's there's an the, there's the importance of um um acknowledging that diversity of context is very is very different you know that in terms of historical terms although when we refer to colonization at least in the context of the british context we think about the the british the french uh 19 um 18 century uh the process of uh, you know the colonization for instance of latin america is very very different and and, and it has different um, um legacies and implications and this in the same way you know the the way in which uh, we study 
settler, white settler societies is very different from um, the processes that uh, happen in, in countries where um, the uh, white population was not uh, is not a, ma a majority. Um, so, so again, it, uh, it 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 is a very complex and uh, and, and diverse um, uh, field, and it also demonstrates that um, this idea of the post, right, that is very much um, criticized in a way, the post-colonial. Uh, the, the idea of decolonizing very much raise the issue of to what extent there is a historical line they are dividing history from contemporary um, processes and, and and the question of legacies. Now we can we can then talk about legacies and and how conceptualize legacies and and, and study them uh, empirically in terms of. Um, uh, thinking on, about contemporary process and 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 in terms of you know this uh, broader field of 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 work of literature of uh, uh, scholarship uh, the the question of the criminal justice question is so important uh, because criminal justice uh, processes and institutions have been at the center of the modern capitalist colonial uh, system uh, and it's kind of uh, in, 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 uh, very much legitimize uh, the cultural and the material processes that um, the, um, that uh, drove those uh, those processes and, and and you know this is a, a, a as criminology as a, the study of those, uh, systems and the, the idea of crime is, uh, you know, is the, the science of the other, right? It's, so obviously, you know, it's quite a significance for the um, for for the project of decolonization. Um, and uh, so, so my 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 thinking around that. Uh, 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 about this idea of decolonizing the criminal justice and pointing to all these uh, no, um, arguments before is to what extent we can decolonize a system, uh, an apparatus uh, that has been so central for um, colonization and exploitation, racial exploitation, where you know race in a sense has been um kind of inventing or scientifically legitimized for by many of the practices scientific uh, scientific practices uh, and uh, uh, so I, i'm i'm thinking when the this dilemma uh, is is raised about uh, an idea in abolitionist theory about this uh, this idea of the horizon, right? Uh, the abolitionist horizon, and and we can't, you know, it kind of expect that all this um, system of oppression that that builds on structural inequalities are going to go away uh, tomorrow, but. It, but the idea of horizon and perhaps decolonizing horizon uh, perhaps give us a, a roadmap to think about how to advance those uh, projects. And we've been discussing uh, those in, in different sessions uh, within the, con the, the, con the conference. I think at the intellectual level, um, there's quite a lot of scope for rethinking and questioning uh, state sanction uh, categories, the where, the why, the who, the what of criminal justice, the concepts and categ categories and practices that serve as the, the scaffold of the system and shapes its core and its limits. Um, how and 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 and. and for us as the you know, 
um, people who, who try to make sense of all these um, practices. Um, you know, in many ways, there has been <coughs> quite a lot of work in uh, questioning precisely the, the idea of the, the, the limits of uh, the criminal justice in terms of the nation state. And we, saw, we see that, for instance, in terms of migration research, um, the, state, the, the extent to which, you know, the nation state is a challenge as a as a as a um, framework, uh, as a spatial framework, um, and and ask us to rethink uh, uh, criminal justice practices in terms of interconnections, global interconnections, the circulation of. Uh, idea, the literature of, around travels of, of the criminal justice, penal transplant, gro global uh, transplant. And this is, of course, an area that is, is very much uh, close to me because I've, I've done uh, re uh, quite a lot of, of research around this idea of immigration. And, and, and uh, uh, you know, if, if we think, um, again, there has been quite a few papers in this conference about this um, um, this um, uh, this topic and to what extent you know the the, the all the penal uh, carceral apparatus around border controls and migration controls um, very much is part of that uh, system it's not outside and it's kind of resembling and, and morphing um, so I, another point that I, I, I wanted to make, and, and with that, I, I, I um, allow my, my colleagues to, to, to talk, is about the, the work that, the, the contributions that um, many decolonial uh, scholars and Southern scholars um, have made in relation to the, the more ethical, um, Mm, dilemmas or, or perhaps the, the, the positionality of us in terms of how we see uh, the, the and how do you re do we research the, the criminal justice and how it has been researched in terms of an um, you know the dominance of Anglo Anglo American uh, scholarship scholarship in in English as a lingua franca. Um, and how those narratives and those pieces of research also frame the way in which um, we see the criminal justice. In the, so uh, we need to be as well very aware of these um, um, biases uh, and also, um, you know, try to think about uh, the, the, the narrow way in which conceptions about uh, this uh, range of practices and systems have been theorized. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to this. And it's been really great to connect with people across different disciplines. And hello to my colleague, Vanessa, in the, <laughs> the other side of the screen. Um, so I am not a criminologist, and I think that I'm a bit disconnected from within the discipline of criminology what's you know what these debates are, are, are like. So I'm looking forward to reading your book, Anna. But I was um, I was pleased to hear that I'm I'm thinking in a similar direction in terms of uh, your what you were referring to as the abolitionist horizon and maybe the the horizon of um, of decolonize, decolonizing as a project um, because when I hear the term decolonize and then you just plug in whatever you want afterwards decolonize education decolonize anything you can think of has decolonized as an adjective these days. And I guess the trap is um, a really, you know, ready-made packaged version of whatever critical theory you want 
is now, you know, the fad is to call it decolonizing. But there's a real set of urgent political commitments that is also within that. And I think uh, I really like the way that you point to the the lineage of different t different forms of critical thinking within academia, but also that have emerged from social movements. So critical race theory, um, critical feminist thought, critical race feminism, um, uh, post-colonial theories, and and also from movements that don't have um, you know the the airtime or the uh, or aren't easily accessible within um, Western academia that are likely um, ones that could really uh, uh, give us a, a good frameworks for thinking about what that horizon could potentially look like. Uh, so one thing that in terms of approaching the, the concept of decolonizing criminology or de decolonizing carceral policy, one thing to think about is what we even mean by decolonize. So of course that's opening up the can of worms that we're going to have to open with that, with with the idea of you know where the limits are to criminal um, justice and all of those things need to be defined so that we can grapple with them. But some things that I think come to mind with coloniality are um, the idea of the state and the state form as one of the central ways in which that's negotiated. Maybe not the only one, but definitely, um, you know, the state as a way, a, tool, a mechanism for controlling populations and as a, a vehicle for colonizing and having that coloniality be enduring. So in one of the panels, um, we we're looking at uh, different ways in which uh, coloniality and colonial borders in, on the African continent, for example, have then shaped the way in which uh, both um, uh, certain types of governmental regimes operate, but then also reinforce certain ideas about how people, um, you know, what people uh, locally are thinking or the relationship of different people to one another. Layered on top of, um, and this came up in a side conversation outside of the panel, um, a way in which uh, the assumption that there are groupings that are more naturalized and then groupings that are colonial and that that one or the other is authentic. And there's there's just this discourse that com comes out of um, the legacies of colonialism that are not helpful in understanding what's happening on the ground with people who are actually producing their own ways of thinking about themselves and about uh, the possibility of this horizon. So I think one thing is to think about how we can how we can frame coloniality as a, a particular type of um, frame that we need to intervene on and how that difference differs and how it's similar to some of the other frames that we might be thinking about such as race or such as you know bordering per se um, because i think that can give us a clue as to whether the questions that we're asking are the ones that are going to meet the needs and i guess that brings <laughs> me to a second reason of being dubious, but also um, knowing that it's politically urgent is uh, because um, the, the idea of the carceral state. So if we're going to decolonize criminology or de decol co decolonize carceral policy, where does that begin and end? Because it certainly isn't only the laws that are on the books. It certainly isn't only prisons, as you mentioned, Ali, and um, it, it isn't only the history books and how we think about these institutions in the past, but then it isn't even only carceral policy. I mean, where do we, you know, in um, Professor Bhattacharya's uh, um, talk earlier about public health, um, there's a way to frame public health as an alternative way of thinking about how to drive social policy. But then there's also a way of thinking of pu public health as an extension of carceral policy. Um, and I think that came across really well in that talk. And it gets us to think, you know, can we solve, can we only decolonize um, carceral policy? And I think this also came up uh, with a, a comment about, you know, can we deal with um, carceral policy in India without dealing with caste? And in what order or in what constellation do we have to bring these conversations together? And I guess that is the, that is, the problematic that we're faced with with I think also Professor Bhattacharya mentioned this in that same exact panel we're faced with with all social movements and in making the um, 
the comparison with abolition, it's not a destination. It's a process of unpicking and working and constantly reviewing the downsides to any thing that looks transformative. Um, so I suppose I just wanted to highlight the the idea that it's you know it raises more questions, which I think are product productive ones that we need to take seriously, but also. Um, in different places, the answers to these questions might be quite different and how they overlap with other movements and other frame frames of these movements uh, will be quite different. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that kind of conversation. Thanks. Ed. Yeah, um, I will keep it brief because I think a lot of the the thoughts I've had have, have kind of been expressed in different ways. I think one of the things that um, has come out really clear, clearly over the last couple of days and that has kind of um, really got me thinking and uh, that's been highlighted um, already by the panel is that complexity um, and how all of these questions and possibly answers vary in different spaces and, and in different locations. But I think regardless of that, um, all of the kind of, uh, the, the, the thing that uh, brings all of those different contexts together is the history of uh, the colonial history, is the processes, the ideologies around that, and actually the role of um, criminal justice systems and institutions in reinscribing re or kind of reaffirming colonial power after the dismantling of kind of empire. So I think that's the thing that possibly draws all of those things together. And um, I think I thought I knew what that looked like before the last couple of days. And my paper is now this sort of lots of notes of me trying to kind of bring all of the discussions that we've had over the last couple of days together because it's really kind of um, perhaps changed. But, but one of the things that really struck me over the last couple of days and kind of, um, I suppose, for me was a really visual representation of all these things that we're talking about, the kind of history and the process and the ideology, the geography, the space, the, 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 um, all of those things, was um, Emily Russell's paper yesterday in one of the panels where she had uh, geo-referenced, I think she called it, which was like put in the, it's a process I'm not familiar with, but put in kind of contemporary geographical kind of measurements onto an old uh, plantation map in the Assam region on one of the old tea plantations and so she what she what she was able to show through that process was um, to, to kind of map the contemporary uh, state violence and trust and distrust in policing directly to specific uh, locations on that plantation map and it really struck me as being a Kind of, wow, this is what what we're, what we're talking about, but this is what it, it looks like. It, it, that was a really striking moment for me from, from the last couple of days that kind of draws all of those things together. That's all. Thank you. <laughs> Vanessa, are you okay to yes, give some remarks? Sure, I think you all can hear me well. Yeah. I have a little Thanks. echo. Um, and I'll just go on. Um, it's just on this side. It it'd be fine. I'm very sorry um, to not be able to be there in person um, with you all. And thank you so much for inviting me and um, to um, for the possibility to be in conversation with such great um, colleagues. Um, and obviously also the people who joined the conference and participated at the conference. And Oliver, thank you so much for organizing this. Um, to you and folks that were involved in organizing this conference, um, particularly also um, folks who are doing the, the labor that's often invisibilized. I'm really thrilled um, to be in conversation with you. And I'm speaking to you from the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee people who defend their uh, communities against settler colonialism on an everyday basis and care for these lands. Um, and I think it's very crucial that um, to understand abolitionist struggle as struggles as uh, against settler colonialism also in its continuing forms, right? And there's a, um, I don't know, I, I recently saw this on, on social media, um, 
unfortunately I forgot the name who posted it, but it was retweeted many, many times. And I find it quite crucial to say, well, everyone uh, wants to decolonize everything now, except of the colony. Um, and I think that's, um, that's a quite important uh, reminder. So when, when you asked about uh, some reflections on the relationship between decolonization and, criminalized, and, and criminal justice, um, what actually came to mind um, was Ruth Wilson Gilmore's um, reminder that mass incarceration as one articulation of racial capitalism, right, um, is class war. And to build on that, I would say criminal justice is a racialized class project um, and thereby also is class war. Um, but I would like to talk about this a bit in more depth by also also maybe following up on what Eddie said to really think about what we actually mean when we talk about decolonization and also how it is mobilized hegemonically, right? Especially with regard to the articulations of neoliberal racial capitalism. So when I think of decolonization, um, this is directly linked, not just to an epistemological project, but to what people have been doing um, in their struggle towards to build life, to build life affirming politics and structures and to get rid of the economic, political, epistemological systems and exploitative systems that actually dehumanize and super exploit and abandon um, the majority of, of, of the world, the majority actually of the people on, on this planet. So with decolonization, all, all kinds of forms of anti-colonial politics um, come to mind, as well as anti-colonial revolutions. And the Haitian Revolution, I think, is one of the abolitionist cornerstones, if we think of it through history, which was a radical revolution aiming at the abolition of the plantation economy, as well as of the system on which exploitative economies depend upon. And I think that's very crucial in terms of the holistic approach, right? So it's not just one institution, it's not just one articulation that that produces premature death, but it's actually a holistic approach like Eddie also um, um, was pointing to that, that looks at the, the internet, interconnections of the systems of, of violence and expropriation and exploitation. So um, another example is of course the general strike of enslaved people um, in the US during the Civil War. Um, the, the w. E. B. Du Bois has famously argued in Black Reconstruction that Black enslaved people are not only workers, but that he has furthermore shown that enslaved people constantly struggled um, against their masses over working conditions as well as legal and social statuses. And during the Civil War, um, enslaved people increasingly ran away, took up arm, arms against their masters and intentionally sabotaged and disrupted the global cotton production. And these actions, of course, were not accidents, but there were a form of abolitionist politics. And I think what's really important that it was not just about dismantling and getting rid of the plantation economy to then be transitioned into the labor wage relation, but to actually dismantle the system that requires enslavement, that requires um, colonialism, and that now requires or produces um, neoliberalism. So the strike that led to the formal abolition of enslavement was aimed at abolishing the system that makes enslavement possible, colonial possible, colonialism possible, etc. And I'm referring to these two examples, and we can draw on much more um, examples. It was already said on the panel that there are so many variations of uh, colonialisms and also empire. Um, but I think when we when we look at some of these accounts, historical roadmaps, um, and there are many others in terms of the various anti-colonial revolutions, um, then I think it becomes more clear that decolonization is, as Franz Fanon has um, has also argued, a phenomenon um, and a politics of dismantling, and he really called it violence, right? That decolonization is always a violent process. And I think it's important to name that. That doesn't mean just physical violence, but it me means undoing in a very radical way um, the systems and institutions 
that uh, particularly but not exceptionally um, uh, 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 um, render vulnerable and disposable and killable uh, the racialized segments of the working class and working poor populations all over the world. Um, and of course, the, um, the, the current dominant conjuncture of decolonization instead shows that it is rather understood as an add-on, right? Like you can decolonize the curriculum as an integrationist project. You can decolonize, oh, I don't know, the, the anti-discrimination uh, boards, policy boards. Uh, you can decolonize all kinds of uh, documents and structures. Um, and it's just a kind of integration into the status quo, right? Um, into the existing system um, to also diversify the processes of exploitation and the processes of, of dehumanization. Um, so I think that's why I think it's really important to stick to the kind of materialist struggle of decolonization when we think about um, decolonization and also think about the layers of violence that Fanon was actually pointing to, right? Um, and saying that we can understand it in many sense of the term here. Um, and maybe two other points. One was that um, whereas Fanon and, and many others of these kind of anti-colonial revolutionaries understood decolonization as a violent process and thereby also as a kind of event, I think it were particularly um, anti-colonial feminists and radical anti-racist feminists who um, actually conceptualized and argued what Eddie already mentioned in terms of decolonization being a process, right? It's not an event, one big large event. Um, it's not something out there. It's not something in the future. It's something that people are doing on an everyday basis. Um, and life in rehearsal, as, as Ruth Wilson Gilmore calls it, right? It's the practice of, of life in rehearsal, um, which also shows that radical transformation is rather a process than an event. And I think this understanding of decolonization already points to the pro problematic of assuming that criminal justice can be rendered more just or can be decolonized. Uh, because the concept of criminality, as well as the criminal justice system itself, is deeply entrenched in the systemic logics of control super exploitation and dehumanization. We just have to think of the employment of police law, Polizeiwissenschaft, in the 16th century in Europe. And I think that's important when we talk about racial capitalism, as we learned from, from Cedric Robinson, that it not just started, right, with the expansion of Europe uh, to the continent of Africa or to the occupation and major genocide in the Americas and mass genocide in the Americas, but itself already was operating within Europe against Roma, against uh, Polish people, and what have you. That not just a part of capitalism is racial, but all of it is racial. And within that process, um, with the constitution of Polizeiwissenschaft, for instance, as the break of the, at, at the break of the feudal order, the, the, the function of criminality was to recruit the, the poor masses into a kind of condition, into a kind of system, and also criminalize their means of survival, right? Of survival in conditions of, 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 of mass poverty. And I think these two functions, criminalization of survival, as well as recruitment into exploitation are still two of the functions we see that the criminal justice system is still doing. Of course, this has breaks. I'm not talking historical lineage here. Um, but if we think about the role, for instance, um, that criminalization plays as a mode of control and as a mode of, of dehumanization, if we think of the role criminal justice um, as a praxis, right? Crim criminalization as a praxis played in terms of um, capturing, controlling, measuring, exploiting black enslaved people and, um, and thereby also recruiting them into the system of super exploitation as enslavement. Um, and also of course, other forms of colonization. And that's where I would say there is no coming together of criminal justice which is so deeply rooted in an understanding of security that, as Marx has said, is actually um, 
the understanding of the, or the main principle of the bourgeois society, right? That kind of understanding of security, which is deeply related to property relations, deeply related to the systems of super racialized super exploitation and abandonment. So I would rather say, um, in terms of the relation that this is an antagonistic relation, the relation between criminal justice and decolonization. That does not mean, and that's why I find it important to, to think of it as a process in terms of abolition, that does not mean that people should not struggle for abolitionist reforms within these kinds of justice, uh, criminal justice um, arrangements, right? But maybe we'll talk about the difference between um, abolitionist reforms and reformist reforms, or so-called non-reformist reforms and, uh, and reformist reforms more further. I just wanted to um, actually make, like, argue that I think even this kind of um, bringing together the, the question of, of is, uh, is the criminal justice system decolonizable? <laughs> I would say it's actually not if we take decolonization seriously. Thank you. Thanks so much, Vanessa. Um, so I'm going to ask maybe one more question, uh, but I really, because I really do want to open it up to the audience, because I think you will have far more interesting questions to ask. Um, but I just wanted to kind of build on this idea of the inability to decolonize um, an inherently colonial concept or set of structures. Um, and I wondered if this idea of uh, the problem of decolonizing criminal justice translates to the question of decolonizing criminology um, and the criminal question. Um, because, you know, a lot of people would synonymize decolonizing criminology with southernizing criminology and this idea of um, really diversifying what we mean when we say crime, um, understanding that crime is a colonial construct in itself. So in, in that regard, we could argue that decolonizing criminology is actually a useful way of unpacking what crime means, how colonial histories, colonial legacies still inform how we understand crime, um, a gang, how we understand these kind of concepts. Um, and so in that sense, decolonizing criminology almost seems worthwhile. Um, but then I'll leave you with a quote by Franz Fanon, who said, OK, so comrades, let us not pay tribute to criminology by creating a decolonized version of the discipline or indeed anything else that draws its inspiration from her. Humanity is waiting for something other from us than such an imitation, which would be almost an obscene caricature. So with that in mind, I wondered what you think are the limitations of decriminalizing criminology um, or whether these limitations you know, are beyond the purview of what decolonization uh, can remedy. Whoever wants to go first. Yeah, Lisa? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I would agree with Fanon in the sense that criminology is inherently a racist discipline. It's kind of born out of a biological understanding that's heavily racialized around what a criminal is. Um, and all of our understandings <coughs> that kind of come from that premise. So even though there's been efforts to shift away from the kind of biological basis of the discipline, it, we, we always kind of come back to it. And of course, there's the kind of the eugenics and the, the, the more kind of more recent versions of that and twin studies and adoption studies and all those kind of things uh, so that keep us coming back to that. And even when we're not talking about biology, we're still pathologizing particular um, behaviors um, and there's not really a serious um, undertaking within the discipline apart from kind of in, in small pockets of work that centralize kind of uh, race within criminology and and understandings of the it kind of it's always um, framed in terms of elevated offending rather than social control and um, so, so, so yeah so I would yeah I don't I don't I don't think so I think there is a turn increasingly 
towards prisons and policing as areas of study within criminology and particularly if you look at degree programs within different universities and what students have access to as criminology students it's very much uh, centered around policing and prisons with a view to perhaps school in future criminal justice practitioners rather than uh, engage in a really sustained critique of their operation or the way that they maintain racialized relations within society. Yeah, so I think for all of those reasons, um, I'm a fan of them. I wondered if Anna, you <laughs> might disagree being author of Decolonizing. <laughs> <laughs> I wondered how you kind of navigate these tensions. Uh, well, so the so we have quite a, a lot of discussions with the, my my colleague, colleague Enrique Carvalho, Anastasia Chamberlain, and Maximo Soso about this idea of what you know what is decolonizing criminology and what criminology is in a sense, because uh, you know it, it has been traditionally uh, an, an assemblage of uh, dif different disciplines, sociology, anthropology, law, um, and I I, I do I, I do agree absolutely with with Lisa uh, and and this is uh, you know what I said at the beginning that uh, you know there there is such a heritage right to the discipline thinking about for instance the work of uh, Lombroso and from Lombroso onwards um, you know thinking about whether a uh, criminology has a future in a decolonial future. Uh, it's a bit like thinking about, for instance, the discipline of anthropology, right? That had the same or, or, or similar tensions, uh, problems, problematics uh, around um, the orientalization of uh, whole populations and the uh, um, Legitimizing le legitimization of uh, racialized uh, oppression, uh, and and you know part of anthropology can't escape that. But I think there has been quite a lot of rethinking of of the discipline, uh, perhaps in the last five uh, uh, decades, um, and I think that's that's a work that for criminologists arrive a little bit late. Uh, but I think from different angles, there are quite a lot of, you know, pushbacks that, you know, we can think about semiology and starting to look at the idea of, of crime as, as the object of criminology uh, and, and, and questioning and interrogating that object. So the, there has been a, a, a range of strands within the discipline uh, and perhaps from kind of non-orthodox uh, areas of, of, of discipline that have been, I think, really healthy in starting this conversation. Uh, so uh, I think there is a future, there is a conflict of interest here <laughs> because <laughs> if we, <laughs> if we uh, kind of end criminology, I, I lose my job. So <laughs> But no, aside from that, I mean, it's um, so. So I, I, I'm, I'm thinking in the, the, the kind of the the, 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 the debates within anthropology that has happened that that perhaps are taking up uh, in, in similar ways from different perspectives. I think probably I would, when I'm thinking about it, I tend to think of it as kind of using the scholarship that's developed around decolonizing and drawing decolonizing principles that can help us to inform some of those kind of perspectives to, to help us to understand it in different ways, but possibly not to claim that we can decolonize the discipline itself, but perhaps that there are principles within the scholarship that we can draw on to kind of undo some of the the kind of harms that are perpetuated through our understandings of crime and justice and systems and all of those mm -hmm. things, perhaps. 
Eddie. Or Vanessa, who wants to come in? Um, maybe I'll just go really quick yeah, yeah. just to pick up on the anthropology cool. thing. So I, I'm an anthropologist, um, I guess. I don't know if I am. I'm in a law faculty. and But I have the same consternation with anthropology, both feeling like in, you know, in the age that we live in, um, it it can hold certain types of questions that legal questions, you know, that, that the law faculties may not be able to hold in an academic sense. But then when I think about what Vanessa said to meaningfully decolonize something, what would it take for us to be actually have integrity around what that means? I don't think um, anthropology, even today, the critical anthropology could 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 sustain something that would that we could then call a decolonial uh, anthropology. And I'm OK with that because it's it's also about disciplines and what they mean in higher education. So it is called a discipline and it is uh, it is there to kind of and I don't use this term lightly, but to kind of police the, the way that we're al allowed to put things out into the world and how seriously they're taken. So uh, that is a part a part of the structures of higher education. And I think that's worthy of um, a broader critique. But I think I think we have to decide whether you know, calling something decolonial is the critique that also will incorporate a critique of the way that we've structured higher education or whether we're using it as a vehicle for reforming from inside, in which case we might as well just call it kind of a socio-legal uh, or socio a sociological, um, you know, criticism of the discipline from inside of it, which I don't think rises to the level of something that we should call decolonial. So it's okay that it cuts off the future of criminology. Maybe it's just that education and the way that we think about knowledge will be different in, a, in mm -hmm. that future world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And maybe to um, to add on that, because I mean, obviously, all um, all this every discipline has these colonial implications, right? I mean, from anthropology to also sociology. If we think of the um, the pathologization of the the urban poor in Chicago, often racialized. Um, and how, for instance, also black sociologists have countered this, but also literature, the humanities, medicine. So I think this is a question that is obviously, again, not just um, addressing criminology. Um, and I would rather detach from a, a term like decolonizing a discipline. First of all, um, because disciplines are also um, as Catherine McKittrick reminds us, they have an empire function in terms of how they compartmentalize um, knowledge, right? So interdisciplinarity is so important. And that's why we see that in, in liberation studies, for instance, interdisciplinarity meaning drawing on um, a specific um, and grounded forms of knowledges and the various genres they actually, by, by which these knowledges are shaped. And disciplining, discipline, <laughs> dis disciplines actually cut off that process to even think um, as entangled, for instance, or as being in relation. So I think there's a, a crucial paradox um, when we try to decolonize one discipline, because within the process of decolonization, we would smash disciplines. Um, that doesn't mean that people could not have a particular interest, but disciplinarity itself is part of colonial knowledge production. Um, so this is one thought um, that, that comes um, to mind. And I think the other um, relates to the question of these interrogations, often from people in, in, in the third world context today, uh, called uh, so-called global south um, that were actually interrogating um, anthropology, um, sociology, and and other like disciplines by also writing back, right? And I think it's important to acknowledge that, and it's important to also name this as a form of crucial of radical critique and interrogation. But I don't I don't think we have to 
frame it as decolonization because decolonization is not just uncovering and dismantle something um, like abolition, but it's actually building something. And I don't know what um, the building of criminology, for instance, in the measures of, of a liberated future would actually be. So it's so if we look at okay, it's the the attempt or the aim or the project is to interrogate uh, the colonial histories and presences of these disciplines. I think that's that's critical and necessary and urgent. And people are are doing this, even like all the people on the panel is like what is um, our interest and our our project. And at the same time, I think because decolonization is also a multi temporal. Um, a project that is also looking towards the future while maybe looking back. Um, I think their uh, uh, criminology does not really have um, a huge contribution to play, and that's okay because I hope that in a liberated um, world we would do knowledge production and education completely different, and that would also mean abolish the discipline. Thanks so much, Vanessa. Do you have any um, replies to that, or should we go to the audience for some questions? Yeah? Um, if anyone has a question, please raise your hand. Nick is one of our uh, amazing volunteers at the back, is going to. I'll get it for you. Just, uh, just here. Dreadfully, it is, of course, a comment, not a question, but um, isn't it the case, and I know all the panel have kind of said this, that really institutionalised knowledge production for us is, in, is so deeply embedded in the will to conquer the world, which is really what, you know, Ness has just been saying. But um, the tricky bit for criminology is it's not only about the conquering, but the contemporary administering of the violent world. Now, not all disciplines have that. So anthropology is a bit off the hook, aren't they? Because all their worst crimes in the past, criminology is still doing some pretty horrible violence now. So I think, I just feel like that that brings some other challenges, which are not, not that we're not all engaged in them, and it's easy I'm not a criminologist. But I wonder if we should speak a little bit to each other about how we envis envisage the role of knowledge production in freeing us all. Of course, you know, because critique is easier, isn't it? But the ima it's the Im imagining of the next world, which I think is neither disciplinary or probably in the institutional structures of knowledge we have. I have been trying to persuade people that however ugly our current conditions of knowledge production are, we do need to know things together. You know, that the world we want to, the reason why our class enemies want to coll collate all of the culture and history and resources is because there's some power in knowing the world. But, um, but I wonder if decolonization is the most helpful metaphor language of thinking of what our collective liberatory knowledge production might be given, you know, the decolonization is one bit of it to position ourselves in terms of what our repertoire of knowledge production is. Anyway, that's a very long comment. I'm sorry, I'm never going to do that again. <laughs> uh, let people actually ask questions then. Oh, thanks so much, Gogi. Uh, we're going to take uh, two more in this round and then. Uh, thank you, Anya. Thank you, everybody, for your, what you've said so far. Um, I suppose in terms of the framing, I was thinking kind of, is it more useful to kind of use the framing of Angela Davis of kind of, is criminal justice obsolete? Um, and if not, how can we make it so? Um, and then kind of beyond that in dealing with broader kind of, you know, what, what we can see of the crimes of colonialism, um, what sort of process of, of world making can we envision that allow for kind of the radical redistribution of wealth and power necessary and 
you know, reparations without relying on those colonial institutions or international institutions they exist today. And kind of how previous attempts to do that have failed, partly because they have relied on those, like trying to emulate those structures. If that makes sense. Oh, and also the queen is dead. Yeah. There's just a lot of anti-imperial decolonial yeah. <laughs> which seems to have Good evening. Thank you so much to all the panelists for your very thoughtful and intriguing reflections and questions. I have two questions for you, um, much related to the question before me. On decolonizing criminal justice, I think it forces us to rethink our, about our conception of safety, considering that a lot of our beliefs about safety derive from um, colonial threats to white supremacy. And so as we are rethinking that, I guess my question is how do we advance the conversation to creating a space to interrogate what those new um, paradigms are for safety? Um, and then my second question is, a lot of our conversation is around criminal justice um, and holding people, which is essentially holding people accountable for um, our conceptions of what crime is. But where in that accountability structure do we hold um, colonial powers accountable for their crimes? Thanks, Jasmine. Should we take some answers from those three questions now? And then we'll do another another round. Um, and while you're thinking, yeah, I guess um, it's interesting you say about like crimes of colonialism, because then uh, J.M. Moore speaks about how useful is criminology when we talk about things like slavery, which were legal. Uh, they weren't criminal in the uh, legal sense. So yeah, thanks for these questions and comments. Who wants to kick us off? Feel free to answer as any of them. Yeah, I mean, I, I just want to, to, to come back uh, because uh, these, these questions have to do with the, with the question of power. Uh, ultimately, and and come back to um, you know some some of the ideas uh, that have been already talked during the the conference around um, practices of of care, practices of of love, um, you know at the at the grassroot level. Um, you know, radical trauma as a as a framework to understand um, individual actions, um, and 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 this is of course super powerful, and 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 it's kind of this uh, idea that uh, Vanessa was mentioning about the, the the practices of people, ordinary people. You know, going about their own life every day. Uh, it's not a new utopia, but it's just you know the the the, the uh, everyday um, practices. Uh, my and 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 many you know and, and and this is why I think the 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 idea of decolonization is in part political because it's it builds on this radical, uh, but perhaps you know. Uh, banal practices in in the sense of uh, being uh, practices that people engage with to sustain their everyday life um, and to connect with each other and to ensure uh, basic levels of of safety and uh, livelihood. Um, my 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 perhaps interrogation is kind of a pushback. Um, uh, around those uh, thinking about the, the importance of, of, of them is, you know, where, where is the state, right? And if we think about the state as fundamentally, uh, um, you know, oppressive institution, right? How, how do we, because it seems to me that uh, the, there is a fragile basis if there is no kind of power inbuilt in this uh, uh, practice. I don't know. I'm just thinking through my uh, 
uh, my thoughts in, in, in a way, but, uh, I, you know, it's what is the question of what do we do with, with power? Ultimately, there's always going to be, you know, we, we live in a, uh, in a world that no matter how equal uh, it is, there's always going to be a power relation. So it's, it's the question of, you know, what um, different institutions we recreate to support um, these, uh, these practices of care. Thanks, Anna. Thank you. Um, I just want to say really quickly for the on the first part of your other question, which was the framework of our is criminal justice obsolete? I've always been. I mean, the book is a great book. I've always been confused about the concept of criminal justice being obsolete, though, um, because it's serving its purpose. It continues to serve its purpose, which is to reproduce these colonial kind of um, frames. And it, it, I think there's a danger in adopting that as a paradigm unless it, the real impetus behind that is to say, you know, it's doing damage. Because I think the, the active uh, damage that the criminal justice, um, you know, thinking and carceral logic does is, uh, is maybe better articulated by something approaching, you know, um, you know a radical uh, interrogation of, of criminal justice. But yeah, I don't know what to replace kind of this radical. I don't know what other you know words to use other than radical rethinking of, of criminal justice. Um, and then the second part of the second question, which was about holding colonial powers to account. I think that's a really interesting one because it, it does go to the point that, uh, you know, it it might not take something that resembles what we think of now as a crime or what's articulated as an international, you know, crime under the Rome statute, all these legal, you know, the legal trappings that we give to it doesn't necessarily map on to and freak infrequently maps on to a real moral ethical sensibility about what, you know, what justice looks like. So it might be that um, those are two different questions. It's kind of like we can be, we completely, un we can, aim to completely unravel uh, criminal justice as we know it and still think of a way to address, you know, global responsibility for, you know, um, for, for oppression. But I think that's just the, the big visionary questions like what comes next. Yeah, again, just kind of following on from Eddie's point there um, around the criminal justice system being obsolete and I think there's a, 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 and that kind of concept of how we understand justice, and I think there's a, a real tension between kind of the bigger questions around how we conceptualise these things, and then the actually very immediate questions about safety and going back to the idea of safety. There's the, the, there's the conceptual work to do, but there's also the very immediate question of how to keep people safe within a system that we're nowhere near dismantling, and, I, and, I, and kind of, um, you know, the day before we all started discussing these issues, two miles down the road, a young man being shot dead by the Metropolitan Police, Chris Caber. Um, and that's not an isolated incident. You know, this is this is something that that happens frequently, perhaps not uh, in the context of shooting, but deaths following police contact in this country disproportionately. Uh, Chris Caber was a, a, a young black man disproportionately affect black men in this country. Um, so I think you know, we need to think about some of these immediate questions around uh, actual safety, as well as how we reconceptualize it. And that's really where I struggle between the, the kind of thinking and the ideas that they were talking about in terms of uh, decolonization and abolition. And actually, I don't expect to see um, any kind of abolition in, a mean, in any meaningful sense in my lifetime. And in fact, all of the kind of uh, global politics suggest the opposite at the moment. So I think we also have to do some work about thinking about safety in the real world context and how we can engage to um, in interventions that undermine the structures that are already there 
in ways that keep people safe in the current moment, as well as conceptualising it and thinking about what it might mean in the future, because what do we mean by future? And I just think that we have to perhaps um, engage with some of that thinking immediately, actually, um, rather than leaving it for a future that possibly none of us in this room will will ever see. And I think that's where, um, that's kind of my issue in my work, kind of figuring that out, to, to figuring out the difference between what props up the system and what keeps people safe. And I, for me, I've kind of reached a point actually where I feel that if if something um, that we that we propose in terms of how we minimise harm and keep people safe within the current system um, prevents the next Chris Caber, prevents a young man being traumatised from repeated stop and searches, cuts somebody's sentence. Um, I think those things cannot be seen to undermine abolitionist thinking if actually there is some real world immediate safety for somebody if that's just one person I think that that matters as much as the ideas and I just wanted to say that because I do have to to leave in a couple of minutes so I know that's kind of deviating slightly from the question but I do sometimes feel concerned and I started my area of research very much from an activist perspective so uh, so as I do have some concerns that that um we do need to do the thinking but we also have to do the work of keeping people safe in in the current moment and so there's perhaps a danger of over theorizing the future sometimes that takes us away from the current moment and what is happening and what we can do in that moment and we've seen some real great examples of that over the last couple of days as well but we don't necessarily have to call it abolition or decolonizing always because i think the other thing that that does is it excludes people from the conversation it excludes communities it excludes activists because the work that they're doing has been going on for a long time before we were developing this scholarship in the immediate context and they might not recognise it as doing the work of abolition, but that's what they have been doing. And I, I just think, yeah, I think sometimes we just have to think perhaps it's all about the, the, the immediate context. That was a little bit repetitive towards the end. No, not so. I think um, <laughs> we touched on this in, a, in our panel on abolition about, um, we heard from Iona Taylor who talks about the role of care in abolition and what mm. she's doing is, she's an abolitionist, but she's doing things every day from the everyday abolition and it's not just about a theoretical pipe dream it's a uh, you know she is practicing abolition mm -hmm. by you know collectively forming the systems of care so i think these questions of kind of theorizing versus practicing or maybe those distinctions aren't that valid anyway are really important mm -hmm. um vanessa did you have anything to say about these uh, to these questions that we heard yeah thank you great great question so really my, my head is spinning on so many things um I think, I mean, I, I would completely agree. The people are doing the work and often they are, um, and those of us who consider themselves abolitionists, I think like being an abolitionist is always also working with the people and being in solidarity with the people. And most of the folks who are doing this in university are also doing it outside of it. So I think that's really um, important because it was never just, it, 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 I don't even consider it, uh, consider it a, a university debate or a university, um, discussion right because it is grounded in practices of liberation historically as well as in the present and i think that's where we see also in these times of multiple crises of racial capitalism and times of catastrophe um people are doing the work and i think that's very very important to also consider the wins right it was the global black string that even inspired so many movements to engage further with abolition. Like the German context, that is actually the concept, context um, where I'm very much politically grounded and work with a lot of abolitionist groups. We have seen so many new movements and new alliances um, working transnationally, internationally, like really pushing against uh, border regimes, carceral regimes, um, regimes of, of psychiatrization, um, and at the same time, we see a lot of like organizing now, even with 
uh, with labor movements, if we think of the US having so many labor struggles since, uh, since like we haven't seen this since a long time. So I think it's also really important to see the possibilities in these moments that are now emerging um, and that have so much to do with struggling and defending um, a politics of life. And I think that's what, what abolition is about, right? A lot of people don't call it that way, but that's actually what a lot of folks are doing all over the world, as Ruth Wilson Gilmer often reminds us. In terms of the questions, Thank you so much for this. I find it crucial, the question on education, because of course, we still need to know. Um, and I think there are a lot of great historical examples, like the freedom schools, like, um, like the popular learning spaces all around the world, often connected to anti-colonial um, projects, where we saw that we have, I think, models of thinking of education in really different, radically different ways, as not an institution that actually reproduces the social inequalities and also the nationalist um, and racist capitalist inequalities we're coming up against, but rather to really have radical democratic, popular um, um, places or structures where people can come um, together to learn and engage collectively in the process of learning. And I'm always inspired when I talk with youth about these questions, like also what they actually want to learn. And I find it inspiring how many even young children or youth I know would say, I would like to learn why my friend has asthma. I would like to learn how to take care of communities in this situation and in this conjuncture of climate catastrophe, not crisis, catastrophe. Like people need skills and knowledges. Climate education, right, is such a crucial, um, is such a crucial um, uh, knowledge um, uh, project to engage with or children indigenous projects that engage with working and respecting the land. I think we have so many um, uh, models out there that could inspire how education could be radically transformed. Um, and then maybe one other point, and that's on the point um, of, of holding accountable um, because I do know also in the UK and the question of what makes us safe, people are really doing the work, abolitionist futures, sisters uncut, and many, many other groups and collectives that are already struggling around these questions, what makes us really safe, right? Starting from um, social infrastructures that are not nationalist uh, designed, but that are, that are actually transnational and um, that what people actually need to, to feel safe, right? That it needs social infrastructures. And some and, and in the abolitionists, I would say in, in terms of abolitionist activists, we have debates around what role should and can the state should play in these, in these configurations and in these projects, right? I think because there are various strands also of radical abolitionism, some rather drawing maybe on anarchist ideas, others rather drawing on socialist ideas. I think we have to figure it out. Obviously, it, it needs kind of infrastructures, but I'm also a bit like the connection between the state and nationalism is so strong that we, we know we need these global infrastructures, which could also be maybe a form of commoning or we, we have to struggle through this, right? Um, and then in terms of the question of accountability, um, thank you so much for, for that question. I think it's definitely um, important to continue and to even scale up um, the resistance of, um, of challenging um, and, and um, holding accountable um, the, the colonial, former colonial powers and particularly um, the major capitalist states of, of, the, of the North. Um, if we just think, for instance, of what's um, of, of the flooding in Pakistan, like we have to hold the state accountable in terms of climate reparations right now. And I think this is also an abolition, this is part of abolition, right? As Ruth Wilson Gilmore often says, it's, abolition is red and it's green and it's international. And of course, with this comes the, the resistance to state and also the, the struggle to, to hold states accountable, particularly in these times of, um, of, of continuing crisis.
thanks thanks so much vanessa and um i'm really sorry i would have loved to take more questions but i'm being told that there are 150 people waiting outside for an event at seven turns out so us have very very uh strict turnarounds for for uh, events crammed events planning but um i just want to thank all of our speakers um one one more time anna eddie lisa and vanessa for such a, an engaging um, and wonderful talk and thanks for the audience <laughs>